you say Black Lives Matter is what? Is a, a political arm for the Democratic Party. That has been co-opted. Correct. On this show, we like to cover different perspectives. So today, we want to introduce you to the new it girl for conservatives. Candace Owens has become one of the most visible and most controversial voices for the right side of the political spectrum. As a woman of color, she represents a unique perspective. She attacks the Black Lives Matter movement. She opposes abortion. She supports the elimination of welfare programs. So she's definitely provocative. But the question is, Will she be able to sway the black vote? Check out this interview with Mike's co-founder, Jay Korowitz. If I had to write a list of 100 things that are harming the black community, police brutality would not even be one of them. This is Candace Owens. Oh my God, Charlottesville. White supremacy is alive and well. Run. Stop. Owens got her start making YouTube videos from her bedroom. Hey everybody, my name is... Now she's one of the leading voices for young conservatives and the communications director for Turning Point USA. CNN is trying to sell me my own oppression. She's amassed hundreds of thousands of followers and fans, in part by being incredibly provocative. And to some, downright offensive. Feminism is for people that think sticking your head in a hat shaped like a vagina deems you an intellectual. In some ways, Owens's ideas are not all that different. She's one of a growing group of conservative thought leaders like Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson Men and women aren't the same, and who have also built themselves. massive followings by wading into polarizing debates and making incendiary comments, all in the name of challenging political correctness. Owens is also far from the first black conservative to get attention for her ideas. But according to Theodore Johnson, a leading expert on race at the Brennan Center for Justice, the way she presents her arguments is what makes her exceptional. Candace plays into a particular strain of black conservatism um, where it's uh, a bit opportunistic, um, where it sort of takes the temperature of the political environment and um, leans itself in a way that would get the person a little bit more attention and allows their message to travel further. That personality has earned Owens praise, from prominent figures like Kanye West, Candace Owens has fact sheets research, even President Trump himself. Given her newfound fame, I wanted to understand how real her movement is and how seriously we should take her. So I went to Stanford University, where Owens was invited to speak by the school's college Republican organization in order to find out. White liberals don't really care about me, bro. That's correct. I'm off the plantation, bro. Another one off the plantation. So I wanted you to just take a little bit of time to explain your background. Who is the real Candace Owens? I had no political inclination. I did not care about politics. That changed tremendously for me when Donald Trump began running. Um, and I thought that the conversation was vitriolic. It was hateful. But I think the biggest thing is that I thought it was dishonest. Um, In what way? When you start with he is not allowed to run because he is a racist, because he is a sexist, because he is a misogynist. To me, it really challenged all of my views. It made me think that a lot of these words are used to control people, um, not to protect them. Owens is on a mission to convince young black voters to leave the Democratic Party, just like she did. Here's her argument in a nutshell. Black people have been failed by democratic policies and are being brainwashed by the media and by movements like Black Lives Matter. So every four years, uh, the Democrats need to get the black vote. And it, it seems that almost every four years, we start seeing um, racial tension rise. Every single night, I think, during Trump's election, uh, Black Lives Matter protesters were being displayed on my screen. If you were a black person in America, you would have thought that you couldn't walk out the door. You would have thought that the police were hunting us, mm -hmm. right? Factually speaking, it's just not true. Mm -hmm. I actually have the statistic. There were uh, 778 African Americans shot and killed by police officers since 2015. Correct. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people, but you, you, what your, your stat is lacking is how many of them were unarmed and didn't deserve to be shot by the police. Mm -hmm. So, and, I, and I'll give you that stat. Mm -hmm. 16. 16. One six unarmed black men were shot by police officers in 2016. That represents 0.00004% of the black population. There are discrepancies between news outlets that track the numbers due to differing methodologies. According to The Counted, a database by The Guardian, 29 unarmed black men were shot and killed by police in 2016. But according to the Washington Post database, the number is 18. Still, Johnson says just looking at those statistics doesn't tell you the full story. So even if relative to violence writ large, or rel you know, the number of in incidents relative to the black population may seem small, 
when you look at the rate of incidents and not just violence, but but harassment, there is a clear disproportionate disadvantage of being black in a confrontation with law enforcement. You say Black Lives Matter is what? Is a, a political arm for the Democratic Party. That has been co-opted. Correct. It, yeah, I, I couldn't disagree more. The ways that Black Lives Matter protested and, and interrupted uh, Bernie Sanders' campaign, Hillary Clinton's campaign, goes to show that there's no deep alliance between the movement and the party. You often talk a lot about how liberals are quick to cry racism or oppression. How do you define racism? That's a... That's a... Or what's an example of something you find racist? That's a racist? big question. Um, I, I think Jim Crow laws were racist. Mm -hmm. That was racist. There can... And in the modern context? In the modern context, I... I can't think of a, a policy that is racist, but um, if so, you know, if, if somebody walks into this room right now mm -hmm. um, and calls me the N word, mm -hmm. that is a, that's a racist term. Mm -hmm. Owens's critics say she's jumped on the Trump bandwagon just to get attention, and that her provocative comments threaten to normalize racism sexism, and transphobia. I don't want them to think that this is a cat fight between two girls. It's not. It is a grown man standing across from a grown woman. Indeed, several activists who I contacted refused to comment for this story, so as not to lend their platform to her ideas. But Owens says she genuinely feels that Trump is helping the black community. And what we witnessed at Stanford is that many people agree. She and her counterpart, Charlie Kirk, had the room captivated, with several hundred students, who were mostly white, cheering after almost every line. And this was at an elite liberal arts university. You pride yourself on being a free thinker. Correct. What's an area where you break from or differ from President Trump? Where are you a free thinker as it pertains tons to his, his agenda? There are tons of things that I've disagreed with President Trump what on. I thought that he responded too quickly to Syria. What are some others? Uh, you can give me some policies and I can, I can I can tell Anything you specifically no. on the areas that you you speak black about? Black America, which no. Which is about race, about black Americans, no, no. about social policy, no, social I'm, issues. I'm fully on board with him, and that's fully why I'm yeah. Job. That's why I, I go around and I speak positively about him, and I want people to understand that we should be trying something different, and Trump is offering something different. Although Owens is making an effort to peel off black voters from the Democratic Party, there's little evidence to show that's actually happening. Almost 90% of black Americans voted for Hillary Clinton in the 2016 election, and black voters have helped Democrats win in the election since. But when you talk about this surge, this rise of young black conservatism, and that we're on the verge of something historic happening, um, how do you know it's happening? We see that every day because um, we are us, right? I, I have people that send emails. Um, thousands and thousands of emails and messages via Facebook, via social media, people asking um, how they can get involved. Johnson says there is growing dissatisfaction in the black community with both parties, and a real risk that black voters decide not to vote at all in future elections. But he says it's unlikely we'll see an electoral shift. There's no sleeping giant of like black Republicans or who are certainly, or black voters who are suddenly going to support black conservative candidates. I think the biggest trend is that uh, black voters are going to turn out um, at higher rates um, in order to defeat Trump-inspired candidates or Trump proxy candidates. What does success look like for you, Candace, um, next five years, next 10 years? Success looks like breaking the monolith. It looks like not seeing 94% of black people that vote voting for one party. Success looks to me like people thinking for themselves and thinking freely. With the 2018 midterms and the next presidential election around the corner, We'll know soon enough whether Owens' movement has real consequence. I'm here with Chauncey Alcorn, who covers the intersection of race, politics, and culture for Mike. And he's also written about Candace Owens. Welcome, Chauncey. Happy to be here. So what's your gut reaction when you hear Candace speak? The biggest thing is, like, a lot of the things that she say just don't seem to be ideologically consistent. She's supposedly against identity politics. She talks about things in very racialized terms. And people, her own fellow conservatives, people like Ben Shapiro, Tommy Loren, um, have called her out on this. So those things make people, you know, question her sincerity. So when she says that Trump is not racist and that she doesn't disagree with any of his policies around uh, the black community, what's your response? When you see the president come out and speak in, in Long Island and tacitly endorse police brutality, which was a statement that was denounced by mo uh, 
law enforcement agencies across the country. When you see people across the country uh, screaming hail Trump and saying racial epithets all over the country and doing it under the guise that they support Donald Trump and that they believe that he has given them um, license to come out and say these things publicly and express their, their sentiment, um, that is not going to, you know, endear anyone to support Donald Trump. You saw in the video that there's what she says now he's he's off the plantation. Um, does that message resonate for, for uh, black communities? Black people are disenchanted with politics and that's very real. She's done a good job of bringing that up and pointing that out. There was a poll that came out earlier this year um, from a progressive black think tank called Black Pack, a political action committee. Research found that black millennials support for the Democratic Party was substantially down from like baby boomer generations. So if you're a black millennial, only 65% of them said that they were going to support the Democrats um, openly or were excited to support Democrats in the midterm elections and going into 2020. For black male millennials, that support was down to 50%. Mm. Um, and that is a huge drop from in support generationally. Is she a threat to the Democrats? Well, um, the biggest threat that I think she poses, again, is doing a repeat of what happened in 2016, which is having a lack of engagement amongst African Americans across America. Black people don't have to be Democrats. That's literally Candace's message in a nutshell. Be a free thinker, um, think outside the box. Um, and if she can get enough black people to be disenchanted with, with the Democratic Party, then she will have done her job. Chauncey, thank you so much for being here. We look forward to more of your reporting. Absolutely, thanks for having me. The beauty industry is massive, raking in an estimated $62 billion in the U.S. alone. And so-called beauty influencers, social media stars who provide makeup tips to their millions of followers, many of whom are teenagers, are radically altering this lucrative space. But people might think twice about buying the cosmetics these influencers are recommending if they knew about some of the potentially harmful chemicals in them. In this next story, my correspondent Jordan Rowling teamed up with the investigative fund at the Nation Institute to reveal the ugly truth about some beauty products. I fill in my eyebrows, then I put my lashes on, I put my foundation on, I start putting my concealer on, I bake my face with the baking powder. It can look nice and glowy. I wear makeup every day. I love makeup, makeup is my passion, and I love the fact that, you know, Every time I wear makeup, I feel pretty. I've grown up watching these YouTubers and I learned how to do my makeup through YouTube. Seventeen-year-old Aisha is one of millions of teens who turn to YouTube to learn beauty tips and tricks. The classic airspun in extra coverage. I'm mixing two foundations today. The first one is the Revlon Color Stay. And I make sure I really press the powder in. I like to just brush on my Milani brunette br pomade. Is that what I want to call it? These teens may be learning how to contour or create the perfect smoky eye. But what they aren't learning about is the potentially harmful ingredients inside of the many products they're using to complete those looks. One thing that um, some researchers and experts are concerned about is the number of products teens are using, the frequency of products, and kind of the concentration or the compounding effect of exposure of all of these products. Many cosmetics in the U.S. contain controversial ingredients like parabens, BHT, and BHA. These are considered endocrine, or hormone disruptors, that studies have linked to fertility issues and cancer. Then there's retinal palmitate, vitamin A commonly used in sunscreens that research suggests can speed up the growth of cancer in the skin. Teenagers, they're not quite children, they're not quite adults. Their bodies are still developing in a number of chemicals. When they get into your body, they can interfere with that development. These are called hormone disrupting chemicals or endocrine disruption. And so teenagers are at much higher risk um, from exposure to those kinds of chemicals. Mike and the investigative fund at the Nation Institute did an analysis of a dozen makeup tutorials posted by YouTube beauty influencers. We decided to review YouTube beauty tutorial channels that are popular among teens to see what products these YouTubers were promoting to their audience and what was in those products. 
And what we found was that the YouTubers are promoting a high number of products per video, 14 products on average for a single makeup look. We also found that a majority of those pr products, upwards of 60%, contained at least one ingredient that has been flagged by experts in research we reviewed as potentially having adverse health effects. It's possible these YouTubers aren't aware of the potentially harmful ingredients they're promoting to teens and their many makeup tutorials that range from back to school and prom looks. Yet those with a million followers can make up to six figures from a single video. We reached out to six of the top beauty influencers on YouTube who have promoted these products to teens. They didn't respond. We also reached out to the cosmetics companies whose products contain these controversial ingredients. Catrice Cosmetics told us, all of our products undergo a safety assessment before entering the market, which ensures a safe application for the end consumers. The others did not respond. As I'm watching YouTube tutorials, I, I'll see like someone use a product and they will like have it in the description below, like, okay, this is what I use for my eyes. And I'll be like, wow, that's really nice. I, sh I need to go buy that like right now. So a lot of the makeup that you're putting on your skin could potentially harm you. Did you know that? No, I would not expect that at all. Cause you would think like smoking can cause you cancer or, you know, drinking, but I would never expect that wearing makeup can affect your hormones, affect infertility. I had no idea. I don't look at labels at all. I just, I look at the prices and I look at, okay, is this the brand that this specific YouTuber told me to get? Okay, so I'm gonna buy it. Or let me try it on my face, see how it looks. I just wanna look pretty and I wanna just, you know, have my face glowing. Whose job is it to regulate cosmetics? It's the Food and Drug Administration's responsibility to regulate cosmetics. Since 1938, uh, we really haven't had a significant update. Um, even though every other area of FDA authority, food, drugs, over-the-counter drugs, tobacco, medical devices, have all undergone updates in that time. Cosmetics are much more regulated in the European Union than they are in the U.S. Under our limited authority, uh, the FDA has only taken steps to restrict or ban about nine ingredients for safety reasons, um, 11 overall. Um, and these are sort of the worst of the worst ingredients. The European Union, on the other hand, um, has taken a look at and placed restrictions on well over a thousand ingredients. Despite the FDA's under-regulation, companies are taking action. You're seeing companies make changes based on increasing consumer awareness and demand. You know, you walk through a Sephora or a drugstore and you'll see products being marketed and labeled as free of some of these ingredients. And that's in response to consumer pressure and greater awareness of what's in some of these ingredients. Products labeled as paraben-free are an example of the changes companies are making. But experts say consumers still need to be more aware. I just want the girls to know, like, as much as we feel insecure and we look up to these YouTubers and beauty bloggers, like, okay, they're pretty, I want to look like them. We also need to take care of ourselves our health, our health, our body, everything. If you want to find out what's in your makeup, you can go to the Environmental Working Group Skin Deep Cosmetics Database. You plug in a brand and it'll tell you what's in it and if there are any concerns. In fact, I just checked my mascara that I've been wearing forever and I think I'm gonna to have to get rid of it. Well, that's it for this edition of Mike Dispatch. Let us know what you think, leave a comment. We're excited to hear from you. Thanks for watching.